work. Uh, so yeah, uh, without further ado, please, Didier, Didier, you next. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I try to share first. Uh, okay. I suppose you can see the uh, screen. So to the, this speech uh, will be a global uh, speech about what I think that uh, we could and we should do at the global level uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, stop aging. So, and it's especially about uh, big data uh, clinical trials and open results. Uh, let's uh, begin with the two uh, most important facts that uh, uh, most of you know, but still today, like every day, about 120,000 people will die of diseases related to, of, uh, uh, with uh, old age. And second fact, uh, maximal lifespan is not going up. Um, if you consider the people who live uh, more than one century, you had already uh, at least one person 2,000 years ago. The maximum uh, uh, lifespan is uh, 122 uh, years. It was reached by John Calment. And since 1997, it's not going better. The oldest woman in the world is uh, at the moment 118 and the oldest man 113. And like Ilya already said, uh, we had uh, even a decline <coughs> of life expectancy uh, in 2012, uh, 2020 and 2021. It's the, the first uh, time in uh, our life uh, for almost all of us, uh, the first time since uh, World War, the, the Second World War, that we have a decline in, in life expectancy. So, but uh, however, what I think and what most of us here think is it is very probably possible to find a treatment against aging within uh, 15 to 13 years, to 30 years, but it will be complicated, exp expensive, and also we have to uh, follow a few principles. The first one is we should share health data. Uh, where is health data first? In the scientific literature, in uh, your uh, smartphone uh, and the tech uh, giants and your uh, 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 Facebook, uh, Apple and so on, but also for the biggest part uh, in the administration and medical institutions for your medical doctors, hospitals, health sector, social security. Uh, it, it has been said that 30% of big data is health big data. But problem number one is not that we don't have, so problem number one is not that we don't have enough uh, big health data. The problem number one is that we don't share this health big data. One example, there are uh, more than 400,000 healthcare apps in the app stores, but there is at the moment, as far as I know, zero, zero public space where it is possible to share health data uh, for all, for scientific goals or for other goals. We have the problem of what's called some, some what's com sometimes called uh, trash in, trash out, uh, the curation problem, the ver veracity problem. There are many problems related to the fact that we use in the world many uh, different commercial software, that there are many companies involved who uh, don't use uh, common uh, uh, methods to measure health data. And we have the big problem of uh, privacy. I will come back to, to this. So you have the choice between anonymization, that's better for privacy, but less good for real uh, good uh, scientific research. Uh, and pseudonymization is better for sharing data, better to uh, warn people if there is a problem after they share the, their data, but less good for privacy. So once again, we have enough health data in the world to know which clinical tests should be start, uh, started uh, immediately, to know which existing drugs are uh, very probably uh, with positive longevity effects, and also to know which existing drugs have very probably negative longevity effects. So uh, share this health data would be a key. 
because at the at the moment the situation in actually I, I wrote most countries but it's as far as I know all countries in the world you are at, uh, obliged to share your data with private and public organizations when you are going to a doctor to a clinic you don't have the choice but you are not allowed to share this uh, for science and uh, you are sometimes allowed to be the owner of your data but uh, not allowed to share it even if you decide to share it scientists will have problem if they use it and they will not be able to publish so this has to change and uh, there are uh, <clears throat> a few possible open solutions i will not go into details because uh, i don't have time enough but i want to say that uh, at the european level normally things are really going in the good direction they have a proposal for a re for a regulation uh, for sharing uh, data at the European level, of course, uh, the European uh, Union. And the three, uh, the, the four uh, important uh, principles for me are there. The principle of interconnectivity, the principle that, it's, uh, that it can be shared with scientists, and also the principle that it's not uh, for not possible to use it for commercial goals and they call it uh, uh, they call this uh, uh, altruist databases so it would be uh, databases that are only to be used for um, scientific uh, and health uh, uses not for commercial uses I think uh, I know I'm uh, uh, not everybody uh, has the same uh, opinion about this, but I think that uh, to really share health data, especially to have publication of uh, negative uh, results and especially to have research outside uh, patented, uh, patentable fields, we uh, should work uh, without patents or at least with, without patents should be a general principle for work made with uh, public money. It's a, a totally non-logical situation that um, research who are, uh, who are paid with public money, are after that, uh, the result of the research are not for everybody and are sold uh, to a few uh, only. Okay, the second aspect is we should organize clinical tests for longevity with all this data. So uh, the situation at the moment uh, is that we have uh, administrative uh, and uh, yeah, kind of a bureaucratic complexity. But when I say bureaucratic, it's not only bureaucracy uh, of public services, it's also bureaucracy of uh, private services. So we, we have more scientists than ever in the history of humanity, but also more bureaucracy than ever. One uh, good, uh, actually sad example, is that uh, to test only one drug in Europe or in the US, the, the total cost is about 1 billion euro, totally crazy, uh, first due to uh, too heavy regulation. So we need a less bureaucratic and faster system of authorization, uh, theoretically at the world level, but at the European or US level first, because it's, they are the best places for research at the moment. At the moment, an average uh, IRB, so an ethical authorization, takes many months, some, uh, sometimes years, and an authorization is mostly only valid in one place, sometimes even in one uh, uh, university, not even in one country. Uh, crazy situation because aging is about the same everywhere in the, in the world. We need, of course, uh, double blind trials. Well, of course, it's not so evident because at the moment, most of uh, the uh, the very few clinical trials who are done for uh, concerning aging, they are uh, not double blind. So one group re would receive the best uh, available treatment and the other group will receive the best available uh, treatment plus the new therapy. Uh, actually, there is no ethical problem because in such a situation, both groups will, will be in a better situation than ordinary uh, people. For this, we need volunteers, old enough, 70, 80, 95, even 99 uh, old, uh, 90 years, 99 years old 
uh, women well informed enough in good health, uh, interested for themselves uh, and for the community. There are quite a, cool, a few things that we could uh, test. Uh, so uh, you have here a list of think, things that we already know that are probably useful for a longer uh, healthy life, a little bit useful, not a lot useful. Um, but to be uh, totally sure, we need this uh, this real test, and also we need more access to health data that uh, that uh, does exist already. For me, the most uh, promising aspect is probably the gene therapies, and also there are all the things that we don't know uh, yet because we don't explore enough. We need uh, good biomarkers, and we need public results also for this. Not only. Uh, public, better public sharing of health data, but also better uh, of the past, but also better public uh, sharing of the health data uh, of the cl clinical trials to come. So before the treatment, during the treatment, and after the treatment, uh, under you have a few of the capacity markers that you can, uh, that we could use. I know that at the moment, uh, many people use uh, epigenetic clocks. I think it's useful, but it's it's not enough and uh, it's strange that very classical um, biomarkers are not used uh, a lot like uh, the the grip for example is a very good uh, marker biomarker of uh, aging of course we should use uh, artificial intelligence we were not speaking today uh, about uh, artificial intelligence we should uh, speak more about this uh, we have beautiful progress uh, with uh, with artificial intelligence uh, intelligence already, especially concerning uh, uh, deep mind deep mind to unfolding proteins, uh, also in soluble medicine. However, it is fascinating for me that, uh, for example, with Google Translate, with do Deeper Translate, it uh, this software is able to correct your mistake and to translate almost perfectly even with uh, let's say bad uh, partly bad data and on the other side the best artificial intelligence cannot yet considerably enhance your health so cannot yet be able to um, let's say to use not perfect data to give you um, better answers than a classical uh, medical doctor uh, or a classical scientist. And for the, the, the fourth aspect, uh, Ilya and others were already speaking about this, is a, a paradigm shift. So kind of a moonshot uh, project, a, ma a marathon project, so a project at the, ideally at the world level, but it could be also at the European or the US uh, level. We need a sense of urgency once uh, I think even in the longevity, longevity community, we need to uh, constantly uh, remind uh, that most people are willing to share health data for scientific and medical goals. We need to constantly uh, remind that general data protection regulation and other rules are not above uh, other fundamental human rights, but must be compatible with them. So when the right to life is there uh, it's not because there are gdpr rules that you cannot uh, have exceptions for this um, and make it uh, possible for well-informed people to test new therapies i said it all, all already uh, before but we need also uh, this is also a part of the paradigm paradigm shift because at the moment uh, for old people it is more complicated to test new therapies than for younger people. And uh, I want to also say that, of course, your health data is something sensitive, but this is less uh, sensitive than your political life, your sex life, uh, uh, much of your private life. And it would be a lot less risky to share if uh, the health system is a public health system uh, and even more important is if health data were not to be sold because 
one of the reason uh, the reasons your health data at the moment is very sensitive is that health data can be sold, uh, can be uh, uh, stolen, and so on. I'm coming to the, the the conclusion now already to say that uh, what we propose uh, for hills is to uh, create a system trusted by citizens managed by a public institution or a non-profit organization where by default opt out i will not go into the detail now all health data anonymized or pseudonymized can be used for scientific research and and very important, not for any other use. The goal is, of course, to start clinical tests, uh, to have the uh, public results for this, to enable everyone who wish it to live a radically longer and healthier life. So thank you. Please uh, uh, don't hesitate to write to me, especially if you disagree, but um, also if you agree. Uh, these are some of the organizations there who are going uh, in the direction uh, exposed. You can subscribe to the newsletter The Dead of Debt uh, in French, English, Dutch, uh, Spanish or German. And uh, uh, I'm listening now to your questions, remarks uh, and so on. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Didier. Thank you. So question one or two. Anybody? Anybody? No questions. Okay, thank you, Didier. Yes, yes, one of the directions will work and, you know, everything counts. Eduard, uh, do you want to present? Can I ask uh, a question? There, there uh, was one question, I think, from uh, Jabak. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hello, Didier. Uh, I am Jabak's interpreter, so uh, he wants to know what kind of devices are being created for the data collection or sure, what kind of device, devices do you have in mind so that to constantly collect the data? Yeah, good question. Actually, this device uh, does uh, do exist already. You know, like uh, I have this uh, Apple Watch publicity <laughs> advertisement, not paid. Uh, I, actually, um, it is already recording data. Uh, I have an iPhone, a smartphone. There are already many, many device, uh, devices who are already uh, uh, taking data. The, the, for me, uh, the biggest problem is not to have the good de devices. Well, I'm exaggerating, of, of course. We, it would be better with uh, kind of uh, uniformized uh, uh, devices. But what we have already is uh, so much that we should be, uh, we would have first uh, to share the health data. But okay, going further in your question, in, uh, in a better possible world, uh, um, one of the strange things is that uh, uh, in the hospitals, for example, there is nothing uh, that people can use uh, systematically like uh, an Apple Watch. And I, in my opinion, we should live in a better world. Uh, we, we would live in a better world if there was something like that, maybe not compulsory, but systematically used for your health and that we could share. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of just, just going, uh, yeah, for me, it's kind of strange that there is nothing uh, really uh, working as good as, as an Apple Watch uh, who is there uh, for people who are sick, you know? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Apple Watch is one of the like uh, one that is in trend right now. But and when you mentioned about the hospitals, that there are indeed no tiny devices that can monitor the health around the clock. However, with an Apple Watch, there is also a problem that it is very, very limited in its use, especially when it comes to the measuring the uh, the state of a person. It's very, very limited. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. I yeah, I, 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 I agree. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's what I wanted to say is the health data. There is, there is already a lot of health data uh, everywhere. Uh, yeah. The Apple Watch is one of the examples, but it's uh, of course uh, not, not enough. 
And uh, maybe you can also send me an email if you have uh, precise ideas about that. Uh, I'm yes. interested. Yes, yeah. Didier. Uh, Jabba uh, has, as a physician, he has been recently just working on the project of uh, monitoring that uh, the health data around the clock. And he was thinking of accomplishing it via um, device in the form of a bracelet. And so I think he would like to send you his project that he has at hand right now, the presentation. We would appreciate if you would just look through it and maybe if you have- Sure, so, so I will. And, and maybe one thing more, question. yeah, well, one thing more I want to say. So I was recently with, uh, with somebody who had, you, you know, there are already devices who are, for example, able to follow the glucose uh, level and so on and that you can share uh, with friends and so, but we cannot share with scientists yet. But uh, yeah, that's to say, I'm, I'm waiting for your email and I will uh, certainly answer you. Yes, you. thank you. I also wear an aura ring, which is very interesting. And I get HRT and temperature and a lot of good information, my sleep or my, my uh, different, uh, um, what do you call them? The sleep biomarkers. Uh, cycles, sorry, cycles, sleep cycles, and a lot of biomarkers. And of course, yeah, like the Apple Watch gives you a lot of that, but I'm sure there's more happening now. And I'm excited to hear about what's, what's coming. And uh, Apple Watch can do an electrocardiogram actually and measure my oxygen levels too, which is really cool. Great, great. 